Hello there, and you are very welcome along to the RT Rugby Podcast. The playoffs are here in the BKT United Rugby Championship. Only two and a half weeks until we find out who is lifting the third URC title. The three Irish te- or three Irish teams are still involved. One of those games is a derby, so there will be at least one team still standing uh, from the Irish provinces in the semi-finals. At least one, maybe two. Bernard Jackman and Johnny Murphy are with me this morning for the regular season roundup slash quarterfinal preview. And the quarterfinals are as follows. Friday night, Munster against the Ospreys at 7.35. That's live on RT2 and RT Player. Then on Saturday, half past two kickoff, Bulls against Benetton. The winner of that faces the winner of Leinster and Ulster, which is a five o'clock start at the Aviva Stadium. And rounding off the day, then we have Glasgow Warriors at home to the Stormers. The winner of that will take on either Munster or the Ospreys. Kickoff there is 7.35. And fellas, we'll start today with Munster. They secured top spot on the table. They're coming into the playoffs on a run of nine wins in a row. They have 44 points out of a possible 45 and home advantage for as long as they're left in the competition. And Bernard, we've spoken a few times in the last month or six weeks, I'd say, about Munster's squad selection and the way they're going about things with sort of mixing and maxing, mi- mixing and matching, not really picking their best starting 15 every week, but holding a few players back on the bench that probably ensures they have the best team out on the pitch across 80 minutes rather than your frontline players for 60 and then things fall off in in the final 20. I think Saturday's win against Ulster was like, it was the perfect example of why they've been doing that, where you had those four lads lined up, Gavin Coombs, uh, Ollie Yeager, Tom Ahern and John Hodnett with, with half an hour to go. And there was a sort of a feeling when we saw the four of them standing down with the sideline that, oh, here they are, they're coming. And they made a massive impact. Yeah, they did. And, and look, it's, it's probably since South Africa, the Tour de South Africa, where they've found that um, balance of making a 23-man game. To be fair to them, they couldn't really do it earlier on in the year because there's so many injuries. So yeah. uh, I don't. it's not a criticism of the coaching. I think now he has, or he had certainly, obviously he's got some injuries this weekend, but he had... Um, a fuller deck to to play with and they've just found this balance and they've needed it. Like even the Edinburgh game, um, the Connacht game, like the bench has given the massive impact. And, and, you know, while Leo speaks about the fans every week, pre and post match, uh, Ray Mountry over the last six, seven weeks has, has been really pushing that mentality of the bench and people being willing to sacrifice maybe their own ego not starting, but to come on and, and be at the, be on the pitch at the at the end of the game, and um, it's worked really well for them. I think they're getting great confidence from it. I think the Ulster game will will even, you know, on Monday morning, I'm sure when they were reviewing that game, he's he's shown that those clips of bench players coming on and making an, a, an impact. And to be fair, I was I was down there with RT and I was behind the goals, and straight after half time, he sent the whole subs down to warm up and. They actually were trying to get on from about the 43rd minute, um, but the way the game flowed, uh, they didn't get on until about the 48. But the first one was, the first impact was, was the scrum and scrum penalty. And from that scrum penalty, Munster play advantage and Carberry and Crowley break tackles. And next thing, Calvin Nash is over in the corner. And it, like it was just immediate impact. But Ulster obviously bounced back straight away. But then, in fairness, I thought Ulster, or, I thought Ulster didn't have that same impact off the bench. And that's obviously... Um, something that Richie Murphy would look to build on, but uh, uh, I thought like if you were Ulster and you were starting to fatigue a little bit, which was only natural because the game was a very intense game, mm. and you see the Tom Hearns and you see uh, John Hodnett and Ollie Ager and even Conor Murray like to come on for the last 10. Yeah. Obviously, they went 6 2, so they had to mind him a little bit longer than they would have yeah. liked uh, with the scandal injury. But he in the last 10 minutes, you just seemed Munster were calm. It wasn't like it was a it was a lead that they could have obviously got caught uh, with, but they didn't. I didn't feel that there was ever any real stress there, which is obviously what Murray can bring. And Johnny, like when you're a, when you're a player and you know you have a very very like either a top quality bench or an experienced bench, or you have reinforcements there if you're out in the starting team, does that kind of give you a bit of reassurance as you're going out? throughout the course of the game not so much that someone can you know mop up after my mistakes or anything like that but but it's more that you you don't have to kind of make sure you get absolutely everything out of your time there on the pitch that there is there's going to be a quality team over the course of the 80 minutes well i think it it gives you it does two things it gives you um you know the opportunity 
that you can go if you know you're one of those players, particularly in the forwards, that the likelihood is you're going off. You can go, you know, you can go fully after it for the, you know, 55, 60, 65 minutes. But also um, your competitive edge gets the better of you. You know that if you don't do your job, there's someone there that comes on and you're fighting for, um, you know, to retain that starting spot. I know, you know, Bert is saying that, you know, a lot of players and, and they've managed their bench really well, um, you know, but there is, and you have to put aside your ego, but everyone wants to start and be part of That's just your competitive nature. Um, so you have that in the back of your mind where you want to hold on to that starting spot, even though, you know, you know that, you know, this is what the team is doing. So it gives you, it gives you a bit of a kick that you want to make sure that your impacts are very, very important on the game for the time you're on the, on the pitch. One that you can hold on the Jersey, but two that you can, when you're slapping hands and someone else is coming up that they know that they have to fit into your role as well as you have done it and probably, raise it even a bit more so it just creates that competitiveness uh within the squad and very much on that match day for that 50 60 70 minutes um you both obviously mentioned there so like for a couple of players you have to park your ego if you're going to be part of this impact replacement uh kind of bench someone i'd like to to name check in that bernard is uh is gavin coombs who for probably four years now you would have said was nailed on starter number eight for Munster and had been up until the Northampton game this year. Now he's still played every single game this season, but oh. is he a great example of a person who has had to sacrifice his own, his own self for the sake of the team where obviously he's been told that it's for the better of the team that we keep you back until a little bit later on in the game. And it's not necessarily because you're not good enough. It's because we think we can get a better impact out of you in these final 30 minutes or something like that. And they yeah. are getting the impact. He scored two tries in the last few games as well. He still played every game this season. And then throw in maybe last year or at times this season where he's had to go into the second row and do a job and remove himself from some of the stuff that, you know, the attention grabbing stuff that we see from him where he's out in, out in wider channels and getting a chance to score tries. He's someone who's not just in these last few weeks, but probably over the course of the last couple of seasons has sacrificed himself a little bit for the for the sake of the team yeah I have massive admiration for Gavin Coombs and, and not just his willingness to be on the bench I think go back to like probably the, his early days it all came quite easy to him because he's a he's a brilliant athlete and he was in the team and he was scoring tries etc and then he had a little bit of a setback where if you remember that game against Ireland A in the RDS yeah. you know where he he was he was kind of the fall guy, which you know I don't think that was that was fair either. But he was the fall guy, and to be fair, he's in an area where Ireland are stacked um, in, in in the back row. So he he went away. I think the feedback was you know work great, and, and I think we've seen that improve massively. Uh, but yet he couldn't get his way back into the Irish team. There wasn't uh, any word out. He just kept doing his job, and then as you say, over re over recent times, he has taken that role of of being in, being an impacted player off the bench and again coming on and actually you know um egoless and just doing it doing it and doing it really well like in fairness and and ironically you know um it's not what he would want but that if he can create a reputation of being a really strong impact player at the moment that might be a, uh, an avenue into Andy Farrell's selection more so than being a starter if if you get me so um i'm sure he's not that's not what he wants but the south africans in fairness like uh, i spoke to jack nino bar about how they got these amazing players to buy into this idea that you're not guaranteed to start and the actual fact that it was so deep in the south african culture was you know uh, uh Razi erasmus and nino bar used to say look here's the 23 we don't care who starts you decide, you know what I mean? Which is a, mi a million miles away from anything I ever saw in a dressing room. But it's this idea of, well, do you want to be on the pitch at the start, which historically we all have, um, or do you want to be on it at the end? And like, if you were the guy, if you were the, the, the players that were replaced on Saturday, on, on Friday night in, in, uh, in Tolan Park, or Saturday night, um, like you're on the bench there for the last 30 minutes. It's out of your control. You know, so you're out of your control. You know, you've started the game, but when you left the pitch, the game was in the balance. And at least those bench players, they were in control of what happened at the end. And like so it is a it's a different mindset. But I think what Roundtree and his coaches have done is they've 
they've sold it well and they've had players who have really put the, the province first and now they're in a position where you know they have the advantage of obviously being top seed playing the weaker teams theoretically and obviously uh, for Munster fans and Munster players point of view hopefully a, a home final which would be an incredible occasion you know in uh, on the 22nd of June I just just to pick up on that I think what Bert said is really important there the sell or whatever you want to call it in terms of getting players buy in that's incredible from you know a coaching perspective to be able to do that and guys so you, their level of communication that they've got their you know that they pushed why the why as as why they're doing this across and that every player in that squad has under understands every role so the clarity that they're getting in that and that gives them the opportunity just to go out and and you know gives them the belief you know, so that's an incredible thing for her. there was all this kind of different things throughout the season. Oh, Munster's not a happy camp. There's different, you know, and I think that kind of puts that to bed given what, you know, there was a lot of stuff off field with Frisch and all that and different people were, you know, coming out and say that it's not that that great. But I think they galvanized themselves on that tour to South Africa exactly like they did last year. And it all stems back to that win that they had out there with the bench. It was clear that this was their tactic they spent two good weeks together out there and and they really kicked on. So I think that's a credit to each and every one of the coaching staff about how they've done it. And you look back now and, you know, the injuries that they suffered throughout the season, particularly around Christmas time, and they had to bring in a couple of players from the AIL. They've actually, you know, they've expanded their squad and that's given them an opportunity to do that. The amount of players they've used over the, the season their net is wider and, you know, I think that's, you know, it, it obviously wasn't planned for them given how difficult it was and many injuries they did have, but it probably has grown their squad and and they found out players that maybe they were touch and go whether they could play, you know, URC. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's been a real kind of coaching feat, you know, as, as well as players buying in. But to get the players buying in, the coaches have to, Make sure that their messages are clearly understood and that everyone gets it. Absolutely. Just on that, Johnny and uh, Neil, uh, like, look at, I I was one of the people who said it wasn't happy camp, um, and, um, but I don't think that's like if Johnny Johnny's been in 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 envir- in a professional environment as well. That often is the case. It's not the end of the world. It's how you handle it. You know what I mean? And the reasons Munster wouldn't have been happy camp was, um, were pretty valid. The early f- season form was was poor. Their injury list was was massive. They lost RG Snyman. Peter Manny and Connor Murray's contracts took a long time to get sorted out. They've had the, the Frisch incident, which is now obviously sorted out. The Zebo, there's clarity now about his future. They've signed Abrahams. Um Kilcoyne was being let go. Uh, or had me enough for the contract. Now he has. So like those things have fallen into they've they've getting sorted week by week, which is which is really good. And also it helps when you're winning. So like like you know, you can talk about our oh, impact off the bench, uh, and of course it's important, and and every team will want to have that. But you know, it's much harder to sell it on a Monday morning after a loss. You know what I mean? So that feel good factor. So I would credit, I would give massive credit to the Munster squad and the Munster coaches for not letting the off field stuff um, affect them getting their rugby right, which is what your professional players are supposed to do, are like are paid to do. And it's it's an easy thing to say, but uh, Munster have have done it. But like there's lots of teams around in every sport. Man United, my own team, useless this year, lots of tension, uh, unhappy camp, but they managed to get a trophy at the end because certain players, whether young or old, you know, um got got put the team first and, and had a had a performance. And that's uh that's often the case. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose. It's how you handle it is the is the key. And Munster have handled it incredibly well. So it's going to be a little bit trickier now this week for them to get that that bench impact because mm. Joey Carberry thumb injury potentially that's him done for the season and potentially him done in a in a Munster shirt. Mm. Rory Scannell has had to go get surgery on that awful looking ankle injury. Alex Nankovell still isn't going to be back from his ankle issue. And Tom Ahern then as well. It looks like he's potentially done for the season and potentially uh, a tour of South Africa, Johnny, which it, it looked like he was probably quite close to making. 
Yeah, I think he's been, you know, he's he's been one of the guys that has re- really stood up, and you know, you know, Birch has has spoken about it during the week. You know, he's one of those sixes, uh, those four sixes that Birch has has meant has has mentioned throughout the week. Like his athleticism is just incredible, and we've spoken about the type of players that they can give you know, their point of difference in those wide channels, how most of the provinces are set up from an attacking perspective, um, what he gives in those wider channels, but also his physicality um, in the carry, uh, also defensively. And it's clear, even though he's one of the younger guys, he's one of the guys that is, you know, he's very vocal in his body language at moments. So he's a real energy driver on the pitch. Um, I presume that follows off pitch as well, but you know, he's, he's, he's an integral part of, of what they're, you know, of, of, of what they're built around and what they have been built around this season. And so that's very frustrating for him. Just one thing on Joey Carberry, I think the last couple of weeks he's been, he's had a huge impact off the bench. You look at that try that they scored off the penalty advantage I think, like I wrote down in my notes, that's everything good about Munster. You know, they play the advantage, they get to the middle, they go back to width, they do everything that they they you know that they've been good at all year. A lot of players play, a lot of teams will kind of tip on. They tip underneath. Crowley gets go forward, Carberry gets go forward, and then you've two wingers side by side. So Nash scored, but um, you know, Daly's worked off his far wing to get inside Nash, but. Joey Carberry has the you know he was integral to that passage of play and I think he was just you know he wanted to he's just playing with that freedom given he knows what's going on and it was just an opportunity to close out a chapter and I think that's you know personally that's really disappointing for for Joey if it is his last uh, um his last performance but yeah you know they're they are big injuries um coming into the knockout stage is not to have if if they are both and obviously as I said Nikeville potentially going to be unavailable as well. And then Bernard, I I'll finish up talking about Munster on Jack Crowley specifically because Saturday was a was a strange game for him. It was a day oh. because a lot of young out has probably have to go through at some point where for the first probably guts of an hour, basically nothing went right for him. He had a kick that a uh, penalty kick that missed touch. He had a kick from play that went out in the full then gives away a penalty in the lead up to the first try the first Ulster try then for the second Ulster try obviously he kicks that goal line drop out mm. straight out into touch gives away another penalty early in the second half the one where John Cooney hits the post from Um, but in fairness to him he found himself in a hole and for the last 20 minutes did manage to pull himself out of it yeah and look at that that's all good tens have those days, um, and like he'll be just absolutely delighted that, um, when he reviewed that game, it was on the back of a win, and he he played a part in in that last last period where he's playing centre of having some big, big moments. But I wouldn't worry about it. Look, I think, um, it, it certainly there was a, quite a few hours from him which are on, on typical. But um, I think what we we really admire about him is that he is, he is that. You know, resilient uh, character, and he doesn't shy away from it. He doesn't shy away from it. In actual fact, the last one, which the, sorry, the one before half time, um, was probably just an insight into his mindset. He just wants to get into his dressing room because he's yeah. probably pissed off with, with how they um, how they played. Just on Tom Ahern, like he actually picked up that injury in his first carry down the left hand side from yeah. that try, and mm-hmm. he was limping for the whole game. But obviously, he couldn't come off because. Um, you know, they'd already used their bench, but like he stayed on and obviously, um, had a big role to play in Munster winning, but may now have have ruled out from you know the the word is it's 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 an it's an injury that will be very difficult for him to get back, um, before the end of the season and obviously the tour. So, uh, but yeah, just go back to him. He, when I he's obviously from Waterford. He reminds me of John Milan, the the Waterford hurler. Like he celebrates, he celebrates with real passion and emotion and. Uh, um. Yeah, he's just. It's just one of the. He's a fella that you just when you watch him play by what he does and how he reacts to to good moments. You're saying, oh, he he's really enjoying playing for his province. You know what I mean, Don Milan saying was, I love my county. He might be, <laughs> I love my province, but uh, no, he's a. It's a, if he is out for the tour, I think he definitely would have been there thereabouts for sure. I'm not sure is there a physical resemblance there, but I look <laughs> no. out for the. I look out for the characteristics next time I watch them. Um. 
on, on the Ospreys then, before we move on to Leinster Ulster, on the Ospreys specifically, uh, snuck through the back door into these playoffs after Edinburgh were stuffed by Benetton. So Ospreys just needed that bonus point to win against Cardiff and they went and got it. Uh, I saw them a few weeks ago at the RDS where they played Leinster and like, look, at they were hammered in the end. But in that first half, they landed their fair share of punches. And Munster, Johnny, aren't going to be lulled into a false sense of security here because they only have to go back to that game against March uh, against the Ospreys in Swansea where, granted, Munster came away with a bonus point win, but Munster had 38% 38 possession and 28% territory in that match. Their scrum got absolutely battered and they scored, was it three tries in the first 10 minutes? Two of those were intercept tries scored by Sean O'Brien. It was as close to a smash and grab victory as you're you're possibly going to get. Um, So... They know how much of a game they were given out there last time and they know what sort of a game they're going to be expecting this week. Yeah, and like Toby Booth, we have spoke about coaches and stuff. Like Toby Booth's been around a long time, um, very shrewd operator. Um, you know, he started already, um, you know, during the week. There's a quote around him that like, you know, Munster are the best team in the league. They finished top, you know, he's like, despite what other people in the um, you know, in other provinces are in Ireland. So he's, you know, he's he but he's He's done incredibly well for them to get in with the resources and where Welsh rugby is at. I think it's a real credit to, um, to him and and to the players that you know they managed to get it, to get in. So, um, yeah, they'll have a, a a clear game plan and obviously with these injuries, they they'll probably think they you know they're going to come and it's a free shot for them. You know, they had a tiny percentage chance of getting into the playoffs. So, um, you know, before first ball was kicked on Friday night, so. Um. Yeah, they're in. They're. It's a. It's a free shot. They're going to come and play. And and as I said, with those injuries, they certainly have a. They'll they'll see themselves as having a proper squeak. It is a. It is a big one for the Ospreys in Welsh rugby. Just just to be there and be involved, Bernard, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And look, it's been a tough a, a tough couple of years in in Welsh regional rugby. Um, and it might not get better. Uh, there's a big. Our strategic review yeah. that's being uh, published in in June. A lot of talk about going to three um three regions um as soon as possible, just to try and make them um financially more viable or, or more vibrant. Uh, I do think look, okay, it's great what the Ospreys have done. I have massive admiration for Toby Booth, but like, there's probably ten points there that they got handier than everybody else by the nature of the fact that they play the Welsh regions. Uh, twice. I mean, it's certainly the weakest. Even yeah, historically, you would have said, "Oh, the Scots and the Italians being matched up together, that's a big advantage." But uh, Treviso are are are, are um are, are back to where they were. So um, it's the Welsh, the Welsh. I don't know what to even call it anymore. The Welsh t- pool as such, and the nature of. So from a Connor point of view, Connor having to play Ulster twice, Mon- Lens twice, and Munster twice. Yeah. it's far easier than the Ospreys having to play the Dragons, Cardiff, and and Scarlets. But it is what it is, and they snuck in, and it's a great draw for Munster. To be fair, I, I I I agree with you. They were very competitive over there. They haven't got a good scrum, um, but it's a it's the ideal game for Munster at home to the to the the weakest team on on standings, but also you would say the weakest team on paper as well. Right. Well, that is seven thirty-five on Friday evening. Hopefully, Bernard hasn't put the the mockers on Munster there now. Um, let's let's talk Leinster and Ulster. Aviva Stadium, five o'clock Saturday evening. Uh, after after the Ulster Munster match on on Saturday, Johnny, we were at Thomond Park and we were asking Richie Murphy about his thoughts ahead of this game against Leinster now, and he said no one was going to give Ulster a shot this week. It was going to be a free hit for them. And he he struggled not to break out into a little crack of a smile after he said that. Uh, I know what you were saying with Toby Booth as well there a few minutes ago where he's saying, oh, sure, Munster, the, the best team in the league, whatever. Um, he knew exactly what he was doing, giving it the no one's going to give us a shot. But in fairness, it, it is ultimately a bit of a free shot for Ulster this week. They've They've got their Champions Cup rugby secure. They don't need to worry about who could possibly go on and win the URC and take that place away from them. Um, they put in a pretty decent performance against against Munster, and had it not been for, we'll say, losing two second rows in the first fifteen minutes, who knows? They could have been able to to hold on a little bit longer there and and come away with a win. They they're in a good spot. Their confidence is up. They just have to treat this as a as a free hit, surely. 
Yeah, definitely. Like, and I think we spoke about kind of people being unhappy, you know, with everything off pitch. I think the security that um, we spoke about this before that, you know, Richie on a two year deal, Jimmy Duffy coming in, um, you know, they've released some new signings. Um, and then most importantly, Bert has already said it, they started to win a few games. They started to play better. They've been in, you know, they were on, you know, as you say, they were unlucky with injuries uh, pre game and then in game um, this weekend. But exactly. And Richie, like, Richie has worked within Leinster, with Leo, Ireland. He's going to know so many. He's going to know a lot of those players inside out. Um, and exactly. They're going to go down and just give it a whirl. And 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 it's a complete free shot. They have a, um, you know, and, and they'll go down with the performance that they put in this weekend. They'll go down confident that they can put in another performance like that. And if they do, it's going to be a very tight game. And I know Bernard as well, like the Leinster are obviously going to have more of those frontline players back in the, the team this week, you'd imagine. But Ulster, Ulster, like these Ulster players are going to know we've beaten these fellas twice already this season. There's, I know, I, as I say, I know it's probably going to be a stronger Leinster team on paper, but there's no reason why their confidence is going to be in any way dented heading down to Dublin. No, I think Ulster will even get more confidence from that Munster game, even though they lost, because yeah. I think that was their, that was their best performance. And, um, you know they they will they will love this having a free crack and, and look at the, the reality is it's you know Leinster bounced back from from Toulouse with a decent performance against Connacht but it wasn't that that team aren't the ones who played against Toulouse and mm-hmm. uh, so until we see them play in the flesh and see how they've bounced back from it um, there's going to be that doubt and Richie's very like Richie Richie will be a new coach in terms of at the URC level. But he's he's got a lot of experience and he's very he's very shrewd, um, and I think he's someone that will we will be talking about, um, you know what he says and what he does over the next couple of years, uh, and and this is a great great chance for him to to just maybe exploit potential hangover in in Leinster's front line guy players. Um, like it's a massive test for Leinster, it's a massive test for their character to bounce back from obviously that heartbreak. And win a URC the hard way. I think it's exactly what they need to do because I think if they had have, if they had have had top seed or second seed and been home all the way and they won it, it wouldn't have meant as much as as winning it this way will be. If they have to go to the Bulls, um, and come back and go to Munster like that, that's a, uh, that that's the very very good test. And and it's, it's probably the only it's it's probably it probably will make it more important for them as into next year uh, being able to do that prove you can. We knock out games um, away from home um, when it when it really matters. So it's a fascinating three weeks for Leinster if they if they last that long. Uh, I might just stay on Ulster briefly because I do want to mention the the back row. And I know we we've spoken about Cormac Isichuku's kind of breakout couple of months uh, in recent weeks on the podcast, but specifically, I even just want to talk about the the actual back row trio that seems to have settled there of Isichuku, David McCann. And and Nick Timoney, because I I did feel under for a couple of years under Dan McFarland, it was it was one area of the pitch that he never really settled on a specific trio. It seemed like you you had your you had Timoney or you had Dwayne Vermeulen at number at number eight, but Timoney was often jumping between seven and eight. Then you had um you'd have someone like Marcus Ray who'd be in and out of the team or Greg Jones or someone like that. It always felt like that back row trio was chopping and changing consistently. And the last five or six weeks with Ulster, Birch, I found that there seems to be a real balance between Timoney at eight, David McCann on uh, one side of him and Cormac Isichuku on the, on, on the other. And they do seem to be just kind of balancing each other out nicely. Yeah, it, it, it's been a big part of their revival. Um, it's been great to see the two youngsters play alongside Timoney. And Timoney, Timoney to be fair, as you say, has been kind of a constant um under under Dan and, and now under Richie and he's he's excellent. Um but it's exciting times for them. Like they probably will need I don't think their academy is as strong as Richie or our Ultra fans would would like. But it is great to see, you know, they've for years they were bringing through a lot of young backs. Uh well now you're starting to see some some forwards come through and um yeah, they're the, they're the type of players that he's gonna to have to build a team around. As he said himself, he's not Man City. They don't have a big checkbook. 
Um, so it is going to be finding, I suppose, uh, rough diamonds or, or raw talent and actually bringing them all the way through from to the, from I suppose, first of all, for to become important players for Ulster and then eventually to be Irish internationals. On, on Leinster then, Johnny. So we spoke about last week's game a, a little bit and I think one of the players who really, really stood out and has in the last few weeks since coming back off a, a fairly long-term injury is is Jimmy O'Brien. And against the Ospreys the week before the Champions Cup final, I thought he was absolutely electric. And watching him against Connacht a few days ago again, I just couldn't help but think, God, he could have offered them something in the Champions Cup final. And I know hindsight is such a, such a great thing to be able to use there, but... I was just watching him on Friday evening and thinking, God, I wonder if he was if he was on the pitch at any stage in, in Tottenham, would that have made a little bit of a difference? Yeah, again, it comes back to kind of tactics of that six two split that they have in the makeup of the bench that just knocks Jimmy out because he doesn't, you know, because they've frawley that covers um ten. So um but yeah, he's been in in great form. Um and someone that is like that when he's try he's trying to take every single opportunity he gets. Um, you know, he's a live wire on the ball. Um, I think people probably underestimate kind of how quick he is. Um, and I think his try, um, you know, his second try just shows what he can do from from range. Um, but you know, and he's for someone that's not massive, he's very, you know, he's very good defensively, understands the backfield, and then it's his versatility too that 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 it um you know what it, what it gives you when he is on the bench you know that he covers from 13 out um but that doesn't help him if they do decide to continue that 62 6-2 split um and someone else has to has to miss out but with his form uh does that push them to go back to 5-3 um and then i suppose what that does is it brings in that conversation around um you know Frawley, um, then just being kind of second choice 10, uh, for him to come on at, at that. Um, and then obviously one of the back rows does that push, you know, maybe you know, who, who misses out there? Then, um, does Baird cover the second row, Conan on the bench? You know, what it's that dynamic, and and they have to figure that out. But Jimmy's been been excellent, and like it was a long. It was it was tough like his injury was tough it was um you know a back and neck injury so you know to come back in the form that he's done and not have any ill effects from that has been 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 really really good yeah, to see. yeah is Keenan quite... is, is Keenan done is Keenan coming back for for any of the playoffs um as far as I understand it's undecided yeah I I, I heard a rumor he could come back for for one uh, for semi final or final, but it wasn't. Confirmed. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I initially, I initially heard that he could be available for a semi final or final. Yeah. needed, but then later on, I heard that's it's probably more okay. unlikely than likely. So I'd say it's it's quite up in the air. Well, well if he's not back, obviously Jimmy, Jimmy, and start a fullback. I just there's one player that I think we should mention is Tommy O'Brien. Uh, yeah. I think Tommy O'Brien. Tommy O'Brien, if he could just get a run, um, like he's he's so good. Uh, He's so good. He just he's be another player who's had just unfortunate injuries and and like the way he puts his body on the line um is you know, like the attack he made on Prendergast to the end. But he he's somebody that maybe that if he, if like I could see him actually becoming a starter for Leinster if he gets a, a little bit of of luck and in an area where Leinster obviously stacked. I know he's. I know he's the same age, or there, but he might even be a, a little bit older. Sort of reminds me of Calvin Nash's trajectory, where yeah. for quite a few years, just kind of nothing has gone right with niggling injuries and stuff like that. So he certainly is someone who impresses a lot when he plays. And that tackle on um, that tackle on Keen Prendergast down in the corner oh. was just absolutely textbook. Um, oh. two last points on Leinster. First of those, Birch, uh. What were they doing at the lineout on Friday night? It was, it, it was I think, like uh, I know, I know. We we spoke last week about how they just played it so safe in the Champions Cup final, and last Friday against Connacht, it was like they just tried to unload every single play they had in the in the playbook. Yeah, um, I think to, um, it looked, to mix to mix mixed effectiveness. It looked uh, like they would have a big menu, right? And uh, you basically pick pick plays out of the menu for a match. It's like they basically 
just put in trick plays and put it uh, and it ended up um, that's all they had because every single play to start was complex um, and obviously they identified that they wanted to uh, go after Connacht down that five metre channel and in fairness Heffernan I think Heffernan did really well if you remember the one where um, it, it, uh, it was in the bottom corner um, where they throw to the front and Foley Foley looks yeah. like he's free but Heffernan yeah. basically cheats his way in and it's knocked on um, but yeah, and in fairness to Leinster, like there was there was good detail behind it all. Uh, but they they made a mess of a mess of nearly every one of them. Um, at the start, and then in fairness, but again, it kind of when they played those breakout plays, when they went away from the five meter channel into the ten meter channel, or into the fifteen meter channel, they looked so dangerous. I mean, that Scott Penny one at, at the start. Like that's what they should have been doing against Toulouse, because uh, they're as good as anyone there, because they've got such good athletes. Um, it's nearly impossible to get get them on the gain line. They're nearly always over the gain line. Um, so yeah, instead there's definitely mixed emotions there. And then the the final point, which kind of loops Connacht in on all this, where we've had the Sam Prendergast conversation for a couple of weeks now, and it it does appear in the last few days that Sam Prendergast specifically to to Connacht is looking more unlikely than likely over the coming months. Um, it does seem, though, that Connacht are still trying to stay in, in some sort of hope of getting an out half from Leinster. And Birch, does, does that open the possibility for, for I don't know, a Kieran Frawley or potentially Harry Byrne to go out west for a time next season? Look, Le- look Leinster have to play ball in this situation because they, they have the four of them under contract. Uh, unless the IRFU really, you know... Um, show muscle and actually say this is actually what's best for for Irish rugby and you know put a squeeze on them. So Leinster Leinster are under no obligation to anybody go, hmm. um because obviously they've already budgeted for for all of them. Um, I would say I would say of the four, it's probably Harry Byrne. You would imagine that's the most most vulnerable. Um, although to be fair, I think two parts of this is one is. Is who would Leinster be willing to give up for a year, um, uh, and see it as 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 part of potentially that player being a better player for Leinster long term? Um, it's who would the IRFU feel would benefit from playing more, and could that help? You know, Andy Farrell for the for the Six Nations the year after next, uh, or or the World Cup in in Australia, um, and then who actually has the the real drive to want to go? You know what I mean? Like that's the thing as well. Like there's a lot of Leinster players who wouldn't jump at a chance to go to Connacht, um, and there's been opportunities for lots of them over the last seven, eight years, um, and they've just decided to to stay. Um, the difference now is that probably, the, you know, under Joe Schmidt, um, was if they were staying, they were they were getting champion cup medals and 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 URC medals. Now they're not at the moment they may get one in a couple of weeks but they're not getting Champions Cup medals at the moment uh, by being squad players um, there's still the, the, the challenge is for the other provinces you can still get picked for Ireland by being a bench player for Leinster mm-hmm. um, and you know there's lots of examples of that um, and there, there will be lots of examples probably uh, over next year or two but it's it's which of those do any of those tens really want to play every week the, the four we mentioned, obviously, uh, and are are they happy to to go down to Connacht and prove that they can help Connacht and 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 perform in a worse team? Like, let's be honest, the Connacht squad, you know, we saw it at the, at the weekend. Like that was a second string Leinster team, and Connacht were blown away. And a lot of people would get would, would a lot of a lot of players would get spooked by that. You know, mm-hmm. do I want to be in a team where? It's not easy. Like it's easy in Leinster. Like uh, what well, I think Leo's win rate seventy five percent in the URC. It's easy to look good in a team that are way better than everybody else most weeks. So that's the challenge. I, and I don't know which of those tens. Uh, Johnny knows Sam better than I do, but mm-hmm. I would imagine Sam would wouldn't back away from that challenge. Um, but would the other three? Would would any of them want it? Um, I'm, I I don't know. I don't know. And the like the other part of it then, Johnny, as well, is from Leinster's point of view, they it's tough for them to make a call on releasing an out half before they know what has happened on Ireland's tour of South Africa. Where if, for example, Ross Byrne goes on that, or Brawley or Harry Byrne or whoever, or even Sam Prendergast goes on it, 
and one of them picks up an injury for a few months, all of a sudden their numbers are a little bit a little bit more thin heading into the new season. And you only have to look back at Munster at the start of at the start of this season to see how quickly those injuries can catch up on you and those little numbers can catch up on you where this time 12 months ago, Munster were in a situation where they had Jack Crowley, Joey Carberry and Ben Healy. And, you know, they had too many out halves. And two months into this season, they they only had one fit out half because Ben Healy had gone and, and Joey Carberry was was injured. And all of a sudden, Tony Butler was in there as a as a rookie. It's tough for Leinster to make a call on that at this stage. Yeah, it is. Um and I think, as Bert said, it, it comes down to who wants to go grasp that opportunity playing week in, week out. Um, and like even this season, you look at someone like Max Egan who had the opportunity, you know, was highly touted that he was going to be going to Ulster, but he stayed. Um, and, you know, that's what the environment that Leinster have created, the opportunity to to win medals. Yes, they haven't won, won in the last couple of years, but they, they do give themselves those opportunities. So um, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Um, they're going to have to, someone's going to have to make a decision, uh, be it a player, um, you know, the province or the IRFU, um, over the, and it's going to have to be made over the next couple of weeks because when the squad is announced to go to South Africa, Whoever is not in or is going to have to report for preseason, you know, in four weeks' time in 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 you know in July. So um they have to, and that uncertainty doesn't help any player or you know, it creates confusion. Um so I think they have to have clarity on that. Whether it is gonna happen or not, I think I think it should be a case that uh, you know, one of them should go and then they need to nail the colours to the mast on first, second, third choice and guys then need to, you know, knuckle down and try and rob that jersey off whoever's in front of them or hold on to the jersey from whoever's behind them. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I just say something on this? You know, yeah. um, and like, I'm not, um, like, first of all, I think we'll get a better idea of who Lens, of the what Leinster see as the pecking order um, when we see the team this weekend because you would imagine URC quarterfinal um, in a, when they've lost the Champions Cup, they're going to go full strength. Okay, so we get a better idea of what that peck, who, who the number one ten is. Is it Ross Byrne? Is it Frawley? Um, this weekend, and that'll be interesting to follow. I also don't blame Leinster. This these are four homegrown, yeah, yeah. Um, Leinster tens, mm-hmm. uh, but it's a very unique scenario because if this was Saracens having four uh, tens or Toulouse having four tens, I think. There would be less, um, less about it, right? But the difference is, Toulouse probably couldn't do it because they couldn't afford it. Okay, so that's that, uh, our Saracens either because of the the salary caps. So it, it doesn't necessarily play out like that in a, in a, in a, in England or or in in France. And then secondly, uh, there's not that bigger picture where you only have um, four teams. And as a, a, a like, unfortunately, the other Connacht at the moment. Um, next year are starting with just Jack Carty. So you have a, a compelling need. Is that Connacht's fault? Not really. JJ Hanlon had a horrific injury. So they, both Jack Carty and JJ Hanlon were contracted for next year. So there's a, there's a there's a circumstance which has just created an opportunity where you would say one of those tens could play a lot next year in another province on loan uh, or a transfer or whatever. And that would obviously help another province and that would obviously help. I and the, and the inverse of this is, I actually think it helps Leinster. I yeah. think it helps Leinster by not having to give all of them little bits of game time here and there. And maybe maybe it'll actually have helped Leinster win a European Cup by one ten, playing a little bit more. Because the other argument, it's not for today, is you know our our our, our policy of protecting our, our internationals. It's not leading to European Cups. It's not leading to World Cups. Okay, we've won two Six Nations, which is brilliant, but. Like we, our strategic goals are to be winning Europe uh, a lot more regularly than than we are as well. And you look at those French, the, the Toulouse or La Rochelle players, they don't get protected that much. Of course, Raj or Ugamola at certain times looks after them, but it's dog eat dog in their leagues in, in the top fourteen. And so there's all kinds of um, things that we need to think about. But just just to be clear, I don't blame Leinster, um, and I actually think. I actually think one of the maybe letting one go could actually help Leinster more because if, for example, if it's if it's if it's Harry that goes 
um, you know, Sam plays more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Ross plays more, and Harry um, and Harry plays more, hundred percent. Or if Sam goes, and it's a loan deal, well, in twelve months' time, maybe he's ready to come in and start. Like that's the that's the scenario. It's just difficult. Um, and there's, don't forget, there's less clashes now with six with international rugby as well. So it's not the same as it was two or three years ago, where they got to play a lot anyway. Um, so yeah, it's, it's and again, it's not Leinster's fault, but it's a scenario that I think if we're thinking with you know helicopter view of Irish rugby, we have to discuss it, or, or not us. We can discuss it all we want, but it has to be discussed by people who actually can make the decision. Yeah, and then obviously like Connacht have they've been given dispensation to bring in and an NIQ out half yeah. if needed, but when you have when you potentially have an Irish qualified one ready and available for a short term move, it's it's hard to it's hard to stack it up all all like that. Final word then, guys, uh, on the podcast, on uh, it's tough to to sum it all up. But but Connacht as a whole going into this off season now, where it it was a season that started out really really well for them, three wins in a row, and lost lost heavily in a few games towards the end of the season but I think ultimately that's not where this season has has fallen apart it was it was games that they were in with a shout of winning and let slip or in with a shout of getting bonus points in and and let slip and um they're losing a lot of experience over this summer Johnny they're bringing in a lot of inexperienced players it's a uh, they're heading into a fairly uncertain time I would say yeah like look they Probably a bit of a rebuild there in terms of even coaching staff, you know, new coaching staff this year. They started with such a bang. Uh, they play a great brand of rugby. Um, but, like, they lost five games by less than four points. Mm. You know, like, that's when you're, you know, they're, you know, five points off playoffs, nine points off European qualification. Like, they're going to look back on that with kind of with through gritted teeth and they'll have a, you know, a bit of regret in those tight, really tight games. Like they lost Ulster away by a point, um, you know, Leinster at home by two points. Uh, but I think the two that probably, you know, the Stormers at home when they were, you know, pushing for qualification, that's one that probably hurts them in terms of how inaccurate they were, um, particularly at long out time. And when they had opportunities to go and win that game and win it, you know, win it convincingly to a point, but they just were, and I think that's probably the tale. It was just that, um, you know, that level of consistency when it mattered, particularly in the twenty two zone, that that that's going to hurt them. But you know, their launch, their launch plays improve. You know, have have improved. They've scored some brilliant tries. They've um, it's just turning the dial, and they're actually like fifty fifty. Lost nine, one nine. It's how they change that dial just to tip it in their in their um you know in their favor. They've brought through some some good homegrown uh some homegrown talent through the academies, which you know we spoke about before. You know Eric, um you know uh, Sebastian down there also. You know obviously Mark Sexton, who's now senior coach, he's had a lot to do with that over the development over the last couple of years. Um. And they've signed a couple of their own homegrown into academy this year, um, in the last couple of weeks. And yeah, it's but there is a lot of experience going. So it's that transition, how they manage that, and they manage to try and tip it in their favor so that they're in that top eight next year. Bernard, I'll give you the the final word on on Connacht over. What yeah. is the what is the goal for them over the next, I suppose, wow. eight twelve weeks leading into the new season? Um, try and convince the board or the CEO to let them spend some money because I don't, I don't think, I don't think their squad is. I think the squad's weaker than than last than this year's, and they've obviously missed out on, on on what they want. Um, it's a, it was a World Cup year, so it was easier for them. You know, they had a great start, but some of the teams they were playing were affected by the World Cup. So, I love the fact they're bringing through young players, but in my experience, those young players tend to thrive a little bit better when there's a, a little bit more experience and, and quality around them so I think they're two or three players short 10 obviously is, is a key one um, but I think they've they've cut too many too quickly uh, without real like Hugh Gavin for example he looks like he, he could be a great player um, for them but I'd rather 
see a lot more of him next year and then um and then start to 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 bring him through instead of someone more experienced. So um Mac Hansen obviously uh, being back, Santi uh, Santi Cordero will be a boost to them. But overall I just think they're lacking the quality that they they need to to get into the uh, European Cup next year. It's not to do with coaching, it's just yeah. playing personnel isn't as strong as it needs to be. Yeah, it certainly looks like it's going to be a season of transition for Connacht. Um, that is all we have time for on the RT Rugby podcast this afternoon. A reminder, uh, reminder, Munster and the Ospreys is live on RT2 and RT Player this Friday evening from Tolman Park, 7.35 kickoff. There's commentary as well on RT Radio 1 Extra. And then you can also get live updates on Saturday Sport on RT Radio 1 of the Leinster and Ulster game at the Aviva Stadium from 5 o'clock on Saturday. Johnny and Birch, thanks a million for joining us and we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you.